I'm going to start off here and just get us rolling. So hello, everyone. I'm Bruce Brenstall of Montana Housing, and I'm in Helena, and I'm your room host for the breakout session. We are so excited to have you join us today. Um, please mute your lines and use the chat function for questions. We will try and address all questions before the end of the session. Just a few housekeeping items. All sessions are being recorded, so remember that, and they will be available later. Please mute your line and turn off your video while the presenters are presenting. Please click the chat icon, select all panelists and attendees, and enter your name, organization, and location. And you may turn your video back on during our Q&A time, which we'll have a Q&A time um, in this, the half hour session afterwards. So each of you should have or received a right paddle um, and a marker in the mail. If you find something inspiring, exciting, new, write a quick adjective on the whiteboard, hold it up and let us know during the Q&A time at the end of the session. So there's a good example. Oh, that's backwards. Do we all have to write backwards in order to understand that? I don't know. So uh, <laughs> hope you guys can read backwards. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Jim McGrath and uh, let him moderate this session. If there's any other issues or whatever, just let me know and I'll try to help you guys out. Thanks, Bruce. I'm Jim McGrath, the Director of HUG Programs at the Missoula Housing Authority. And today we have three um, really important really big projects and we want to hear from them and, and uh, learn from from what what going big is here in the big sky uh, I my understanding is that each project's going to like give a little nutshell on a couple of, of slides and I forget who's supposed to go first um, I'll be going first great Jim. go for it thank you okay uh, my name is Greg Dunfield. I'm with GMD Development. Uh, we're based out of Seattle, Washington, but as many know, we are very active in Montana. We like Montana a lot. I uh, really enjoy working with our partners over there. Um, I'm going to start uh, with a little description of our most recent uh, project. It is a big one uh, located in just a minute, just trying to, I thought this would be easy. Here we go. Um, share my screen here. Um, Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, let me know if you're not. Uh, but uh, this uh, project is located in Bozeman, Montana, uh, obviously one of the highest growth markets in Montana. Uh, it is located, as you can see from this site map, just south of I-90 and east of Lowe's. Um, and you know, it is a, uh, it has several components. Um, what we're looking down on are basically you know the four components here starting with family housing uh, which is the arrow leaf park project uh, then we have perennial park which is a senior housing component um, and the real special feature of this project are the uh, community service facilities we're able to incorporate uh, being in a qualified census tract we were able to take advantage of a uh, section 42 provision that allows us to include those community facility community service facilities in the eligible basis of the housing project thereby creating equity to help these local partners uh, build these complementary uh, facilities and services adjacent to these senior and family properties. Um, really a fantastic combination, um, starting with uh, community health partners in the purple, uh, which is a low cost medical clinic. And then we have uh, Family Promise uh, Early Childhood Learning Center in the bottom right, which is the brown. Um, so. A lot of synergy going on here with the housing and the services, and um, it, uh, it it's it's really exciting project that is under construction right now. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find my mouse on the three screens I have in front of me. Uh, so Arrowleaf Park, as you can see here, is is 138 units. Uh, Perennial Park for seniors is 96 units. Uh, we really like to try and you know broaden the income band and targeting and rents. Um, that's why you're seeing units of 50, 60, and 70% of AMI. Uh, they, they all do average out to 60% of AMI, which is uh, the typical program in Montana. Um, again, we have a, a childcare facility being uh, brought together by Family Promise. Um, 
we have some interesting features there in terms of partnerships they've created with Montana State University, uh, MSU, and um, some intergenerational programming. Uh, we also have next to that in front of the senior project, the healthcare clinic, 15,000 square feet, um, serving lower income families and seniors uh, at a sliding scale fee. So again, a great use to complement the housing. Um, and it is under construction. Here's a nice wintry looking uh, muddy uh, job site, um, but it is coming out of the ground uh, in Bozeman right now. And uh, we're pretty excited about it. So that's the overview of the project. I don't know, Jim, were we gonna get into the questions now or we're gonna do that later? I think everybody's gonna introduce their project and then we'll start the questions. Okay, uh, so I'll just click to the next project here. I'm not sure which one that is, but I will keep clicking when somebody tells me to. Okay, that would be Lori. That Lori, would be before, me. Lori, before you take off, Tracy, uh -huh. is there anything you wanted to add? Oh, to I'm so sorry. Contact it's okay. It's your partner. It's just saying. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I think that I, I think we're well covered for right now. I, I apologize. Oh, you're fine. I was rolling. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Jim. Uh, this uh, pro I'm Lori Davidson. I'm the executive director of the Missoula Housing Authority, and this is a project that we call Villaggio. That is uh, a project with that, <clears throat> sorry, that has two five-story buildings. You can see building A and building B. One of the big challenges on this site was the site itself. Um, all of this bare area up here is a steep hillside that was not buildable. We had to design around that. Um, the project has uh, just under 350,000 square feet. There is uh, underground parking, well, partially underground, six feet under, six feet above ground. Um, we do have some uh, on street or, you know, off site parking here. And we also have some parking along Otis Street and Shakespeare Street. Um, so we had some real uh, big site constraints and I had to get some variances for easements and. Um, lots of different challenges. And as we went into the building design, I think the building design was one of the most difficult parts of this project for us. Um, it is a $62,474,000 project of which 42,183,000 is construction cost. Um, you can move forward, Greg. I have just a couple renderings of what this is going to look like. Uh, again, it, it's a they're massive buildings. They're very large buildings, but we think we've done a really good job of fitting them into the site and having them be compatible. If you go just to the last one there, um, Greg, please. And this is a view of the leasing office in the front. Um, we are just breaking ground on the project. We have many, many partners here, um, which may, may not be the right time to go into uh, now as we're just introducing the projects. But uh, we're also having a groundbreaking ceremony on uh, Thursday at 1.30. It will be virtual. So if you'd like to join us for that, you can go to the missoulahousing.org website and the link to join the Zoom uh, session is there. And I think that's an introduction and we can get into more details as we go along. Great, thanks, Lori. Uh, this is Heather, I'm Heather McMillan. I'm the project development director for Homeward. Uh, we're located here in Missoula. And my project partners on this project, the third that we're going to talk about and reference throughout our question and answer session are Lori Davidson and the Missoula Housing Authority and Nate Richmond with Blue Line. Um, so what I, I think would be good to point out is that, you know, gosh, darn it, let's not do anything the same way twice. Um, all of these projects are 4% only low income housing tax credit projects. And we all had our own special issues. And so to make this just yet a little more complicated, we're three partners on this project and we have a scattered site. 
And so you can see um, in Missoula that we uh, had to name the project Trinity Cooley, which is a one city block um, in the north side, west side neighborhood. And then the county, uh, Missoula County donated land um, out on Mullen um, for the second uh, part of the project. Go ahead and advance, Greg. I would just add that um, Blue Line is also one of our development partners, Nate Richmond, um, who's on here around Bellagio, so he's busy. Yeah, and I might add, you guys just closed Bellagio and we're desperately getting to the point of wanting to close uh, on Trinity. So it's been a fun pandemic uh, working on the project. <laughs> we'll get into that more. Um, the Cooley site is the site that's a city block and that houses 72 workforce housing homes. Uh, we are utilizing income averaging on this project across both sites. And so really the larger bedrooms and uh, a little bit higher incomes, arranging family type style homes um, are on this uh, Cooley site. And there are two, there are four buildings. There are uh, townhomes, which you can see the little birdhouses along the way, and then some larger scale buildings. And so four different buildings on the site. Go ahead, Greg. The Mullen gets a little more complicated. Uh, Mullen is actually a combination. Uh, so we have 100 workforce homes, uh, same traditional low income housing tax credit targets that we are having on the Cooley site, but then we also have 30 permanent supportive homes, uh, which you can indicate on that site plan is the um, pink for lack of a better description. Plus the blue on that site is also a navigation center, which Lori has a much better description of the services and what we're calling that now, but I'm just gonna to default to the, that's our uh, community facility portion of the project allowed by the QCT and all the components of the tax credit program. And that will be open to the public uh, as well. Go ahead and advance. You can see the elevations. Uh, this is the workforce housing, the majority of it. Uh, Intrinsic is our architect, Ada Bozeman. I think Intrinsic's the architect on two of the projects you're looking at now. Uh, but this is really, a, this is a taller building, four-story building uh, that has the 100 workforce homes. Go ahead and advance, Greg. And then you can see a picture of our navigation center uh, there at the top. And you can kind of get a shot of the overall site plan again with the building masses. And on the bottom right, those are the 30, permanent supportive homes with service provider space within that building. And we can get into some more of those details as we go. I think that's it for the slides. Well, great. So now let's, uh, we'll do some questions. We came up with four essential questions and, and then we, that was all we could think of, but I'm sure you guys could think of a whole bunch more. So we'll keep an eye out for your, for your questions. Um, but, you know, as we, if we really want to move the needle, as they say, in, in affordable housing, we have to do build a lot of housing, and and to build a lot of housing, we have to have these big projects. Um, and, but they're they're not just bigger. Um, so we wanted to kind of share, uh, let these folks who are in various stages of of doing these uh, share with you all um, their reflections on that, uh, on, uh, what this scale means this is not uncommon around the country but it is not it is pretty new here and the and the development uh, community here affordable housing development community here is uh is not used to this scale so first of all um, and i'll be going around but the first question is sort of how does the size of the risk uh, relate to your agency overall because this is a much larger project much larger risk um how does that um feel i'm going to start with Lori on that one thanks jim um, we are currently involved in two of these big projects, both Trinity and Bellagio are, uh, we are partnering on. And the risk for us is huge, quite frankly. If you're a full-time developer, um, like Greg and uh, Nate and Heather, you usually have two projects, maybe not of this size, but you're usually running two, three, multiple projects at a time. But if you're an agency like we are, a, a, you know, a housing authority or a nonprofit agency that does a lot of other things besides development, having partners is essential. And having two 
200 plus unit projects going on at the same time is quite challenging. Um, the risk to the housing authority is, as I said, huge. You take on all of the guarantees for construction completion, for operations, um, for uh, uh, you guarantee basically everything that everything is gonna come out as is promised to the investors. So as the general partner, you're taking on a huge risk and it's a financial risk um, as well as a reputational risk because if the projects fail, um, people wanna know why. And uh, if something goes wrong, even after the project is complete, you as the general partner are responsible. So um, I, uh, made a, I made sure that we had our board involved all along the way. Every time I saw things that raised, um, that I thought increased our risk, I would go to the board and, and explain what was going on and get their approval to move forward with the project. We had many, many challenges on both of these projects and um, we can talk about those if anyone's interested in hearing them. But um, so I think the, you're taking on the, you're taking on actually almost 100% of the risk eventually in these projects. And you're also taking on the risk of compliance that the uh, projects will stay in compliance with the tax credit program. That is all on the general partner. So yeah, it's a big risk. Tracy, how does it work for your, your agency? Yeah, so it's a little different for us, of course, because we're the nonprofit partner um, with GMD. And I think something that was interesting about this parcel was that um, we had been exploring purchasing this parcel and moving forward with a development um, in our own right as HRDC without a partner. And, you know, really then kind of discovered that GMD had also been exploring the use of the parcel. And we thought, well, this is ridiculous. Why would we get into a bidding board when we know that we both have the ability to um, partner and bring this project, you know, bring a better project to, into our community. And, you know, for our part as an organization, of course, we have um, led our own projects. We have been nonprofit partners on projects. You know, we've kind of worked in a variety of um, methods and um, every project has looked a little bit different. But um, at the time that we were engaging in discussions around this project, we had um, two large home ownership projects occurring across Gallatin County. We were doing another rental project in Livingston. We were a partner with Homeward on a project in Livingston as well. Um, we had just completed our own um, acquisition rehab of an RD project. And I think that from a developmental capacity um, standpoint, and I guess we were also just entering over 200 units into a um, acquisition rehab scattered site, 4% across Gallatin and Park, or across Gallatin and Park counties. And as we started talking organizationally about our capacity, um, partnering with an organization like GMD um, that really had a proven track record and you know, particularly understood the nuances of working in Bozeman, um, which can sometimes present challenges that um, maybe, um, maybe are different um, than in other communities um, in Montana and even in, within the service area where GMD has been working all over the nation. Um, I think that you know, for us, it really was a very easy decision to um, partner with GMD. Um, it did reduce our organizational risk um, because we knew that we were bringing that we were going to be able to work with a well-established partner. And um, I think you know, GMD has done a fantastic job of being very patient with this entire project. In that, you know, I think Greg could go into more detail, but. Um, this site was a PUD within a PUD, um, which is never easy and required a really um, long period of time to get all of those sign offs. So um, for us, from an organizational risk management standpoint, this was the, this was the structure that made sense um, to actually get those units on the ground as rapidly as possible. Great, and Heather. Great. Yeah, um, so many things I want to say, but I'll try to distill it throughout the questions. But I would say 
for us, it goes back to a moment in time when Andrea and I were in Helena and we were talking with funders about how we could put this project together. And, you know, we were already in the pretty well into the planning stages, but I remember pacing around the brew pubs entry talking to, I called Lori, having the realization. I said, you know, we're doing income averaging. We're spreading it across both sites. We're putting home units on a certain site and HTF on another site. I think honestly, you just have to recognize we're going to be married a really long time. There's no easy exit at year 15 when the tax credit equity partner leaves and we separate. I mean, we're Siamese twins for a really long time. And I think that was kind of one of the big things that um, really struck me as it's risk, but it's also comfort because I mean, this whole idea, Trinity's whole idea, Nate and I had a conversation at our luncheon. We sat down afterwards, and this is probably why I shouldn't hang out with Tracy at bars in Kalispell or Nate at luncheons, but um, we get all these great ideas. But we both had two, these were two projects. They were individual projects uh, to begin with, but they were a little bit too big for a 9%, and they were a little bit too small for a 4% standalone. We just had, they were both sitting there. Um, kind of in this decision-making point. And so we decided that it, we were stronger together. And I feel like that helped mitigate our risks. And at times it got a little bit awkward because we're all very strong developers. Um, and in our own right, we have our own projects. Um, we do this all the time and have thousands of units. And so, but I do think at the end of the day, because we're nearing closing, we had a little hiccup again, uh, and we are hoping to be closed by today. But we are so close and really it took all three of us. I mean, Jim is a magician when it comes to vouchers and how they work and that with their cornerstone project, um, we haven't done that before. So the housing authority uh, putting the vouchers in the project, also the management team you heard earlier talk is why, you know, we can breathe it at night kind of thing. You know, we had all the local, we had the, the county's land donation came in, um, careful where you get donated because we had to go through a minor subdivision, but we had to do it at breakneck speed. So the county's donation was great and the city staff were amazing, um, but that took all of our effort for the last year. And then GMD, I mean, uh, um, not GMD, I partner with GMD at time to time, but Blue Line, I mean, Nate and his crew, they've done this before. They've done it in other states that just hadn't done it here but they'd never have had development partners as their nonprofit partners, really. It was more service providers and those things. So I think the risk for us was mitigated by as frustrated as we may have gotten from at together point to point as we went, that was also the only reason we made it through together um, to the point we were at today. So um, it's complicated with three. The structure for us is that Housing Authority and Homeward are the general partners. And it sounds easy to be 50-50 until you have to write all the documents. Um, but we're getting there. Um, and then we're um, three part, three developers, three equal developers. So um, there's so many documents and so many outlined agreements, but at the end of the day, I just, I, I feel like it would have been a, a much larger risk to Homeward and a, a drain on capacity because it's been a long process to get where we are today. And uh, I think that the risk was mitigated by the strength of the partners. Okay, so both you and Tracy have sort of slid into the next question, which is about how's it working with partners. And so I'm going to go ahead and open it up also to Nate, um, and and then and Greg, and then Lori. But let's start with Nate in terms of uh, partners, and you can pick whatever all the projects you want. <laughs> sure. Well, um, since all of, most of the partners are on the Zoom here, I have to be kind, I think. But no, it's it was. Uh, partners and it's always sort of a feeling out per, um, at the beginning trying to figure out who's going to do what and where someone's strengths lie and where and where they don't and I think uh, we, we typically try to start off with a roles and responsibilities sheet and that roles and responsibilities sheet um, lays out kind of start to finish the best guesses we can of what's going to be entailed in the deal and ultimately who's responsible for it and that's not to say that they're the only ones working on it but it's going to be sort of the gatekeeper of that particular part of the deal. You know, if you start with the tax credit application, for instance, everyone in both Trinity and Villaggio that are involved with the deal have a piece of that application, but ultimately someone has to be with the responsible party to gather that and submit it. And same thing as you get through when you get into due diligence and design, 
Um, you have to have someone that's the ultimate responsible party for that. And I think that makes things go smoother. Um, I didn't say smooth, I said smoother. Uh, there's always bumps in the road and there's, you know, there's a lot of different personalities and a lot of different uh, ideas that go into these. And it's just a matter of making sure you, you hear them all and you, and you accept them all and, and come to some sort of agreement. And so I, I, you know, we work a lot on all of our projects with various nonprofit partners, housing authorities and, and for-profit partners. And it's, it is a, a different feel on every project. And, and these two in particular were, were both unique and, but I think ultimately we're, you know, we're at the finish line with getting Bellagio closed and under construction and we're just about there with Trinity. So we, we've made it work. Greg, partners. Um, well, couldn't do without them. Um, we have two fabulous ones on the call here. I think it's probably a third with uh, our NeighborWorks partner. Um, you know, for us, uh, you know, it's, it's really great to have a local partner to help us network, um, basically bring, bring the team together. I mean, I think affordable housing, the neat thing about affordable housing is, you know, we, we do create these teams to create these projects. And through the synergy of that team, we're able to solve problems together um, and bring more ideas to the table. Uh, and I think it's, it's just a, it's a really, it's actually a really fun process in a lot of ways. Uh, it is a little, it gets a little hairy sometimes, but I think, you know, once you, have vetted your partner because uh, as Heather pointed out, you, you are together for 15, 18 years and you need to, you know, trust that other organization uh, to trust their, you know, their goals, intentions. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done many partnerships in my career. Uh, some, some have not turned out well, <laughs> to be honest, um, even though I, I did as much vetting as I could early on, um, both, you know, in terms of projects and even, with my company in terms of certain high level, you know, partners, um, I can't emphasize enough to make sure that, you know, clearly identify the, the sort of the business relationship uh, going in, keep it simple, um, keep, keep put it in writing, uh, talk about the tough topics. Um, you know, everybody knows where the lines are uh, so that expectations can be created appropriately. And people, you know, the team understands, you know, what their roles are and, and and responsibilities, um, and so it's clear. I, I think where I've seen partnerships go sideways is when expectations were different, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, you're getting into detailed negotiations about, you know, LPAs and development agreements, and you know that 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 should have been done way up front in a two or three page LOI. So um, again, we uh, we love partnering. I think think the pro types of projects we're able to achieve with partners. Uh, is is really great. Um, maybe I, I thought I'd share a few other comments uh, following up on Lori and Heather and, and Tracy's comments on on risk. I guess um, you know with larger projects now starting to, to mean it, you happen across Montana, um, it is there. There's a different nature to them. I mean, number one, they're they're usually a you know pretty multi year effort. I mean, I think the biggest challenge to uh, larger projects in Montana is just finding sites. Um, you've seen some really great examples uh, here of projects that they've been able to find, you know, well-located, qualified sense of track locations that have been able to incorporate community service facilities, which are, you know, probably the, the highest pinnacle outcome of leveraging, you know, the tax and bond program, but um, they're hard to find. They're really hard to find. And usually they include annexation, road extensions, utility extensions, um, and they add those kinds of things. I mean, really add duration to the pre-development schedule. And that, that is where your risk is. Um, you know, I, you know we, we approach projects um, in terms of you know, the site and what it's needed to be processed or added to it. Um, we, we try to sort of segment that risk duration you know, at different stages, how we're mitigating that. Uh, and I hate to talk about it, but sometimes you, you have to have an exit strategy. You know, is, is this piece of land you know, are you adding value to this piece of land so that you can mitigate your out-of-pocket do dollars and organizational time um, with this effort? Because you are going to have to navigate, you know, again, one, two, three years before you get to a closing where you can maybe take some marbles off the table and you're going to see financial markets change, uh, program requirements change, legislative tax changes, 
Uh, all of these things happen and affect your bottom line, which again, I when you start feasibility, you know, doing feasibility on these things, um, st start out generous. <laughs> Don't start out skinny <laughs> because you will use it up. And, uh, you know, that, that's something we've learned. I mean, we, there, there just are always variables or things that come up that you cannot control. COVID, who knew, right? Everything was going great in January of 2020. And all of a sudden, boom, we, lost, we, we had timing delays that was into the seven figures. Um, and it, it is what it is. So, you have to be prepared for those things. And when you're talking about, I mean, Lori, you know, $60 million project, uh, Airlift Perennial, all these projects are north of 50 up to $70 million projects. And, you know, 25 basis point change in interest rates, you know, two weeks before you're closing could be a million dollar difference. So your, your $2 million developer fee just went down to a million. Anyway, I, I'm sort of plugging for developer fee because it is one of the main only ch uh, cushions in these transactions. And when you're talking about a 50 to $70 million transaction, one to $2 million is, it's not a lot of money. Um, and it, and it can, it can be swayed pretty quickly. Um, so, um, uh, and then my last point, yeah, with, with, once you get in, you know, find your site, get the train rolling, the train starts building momentum. And again, fantastic to have great local partners because problems come up and you help solve them and financial resources just, finding the right people to solve things. Um, but once that train starts rolling, you get to a point where probably about three to four months out from closing that you can't stop. You've got to get to closing. And so you need to make sure that you've got cushion and uh, reliable partners, both you know, not only general partners, but financial partners, your lender and investor that understand the importance of getting to the goal line. Because but one of these going down is, you know, it's, it's a seven figure number. Uh, I'm sure Lori and Heather, you guys have exposed yourselves to that kind of exposure, but you get to a point where, you know, you're, you're into this for, you know, 1.5, $2 million, or maybe, and you've taken the land down plus the, plus the land. Um, you've, you've got to close that transaction. And so you've got to stay, you know, really have the whole team working together to achieve that. So those are my risk comments. Great. That was excellent. Um, so Lori, uh, Back to sort of talking about working with partners, I want you to talk a little bit about the specific partnership in Bellagio, uh, which Jeff mentioned, and then maybe if you can, uh, uh, the role of com community-wide partners, particularly uh, particularly in Trinity, but I'll, but in general, in terms of folks who may not have uh, have their arm and you know, their foot in the deal or whatever, but but are really important partners. I think you're still muted, Lori. There you go. So at Villaggio, we have two developer partners. One is um, a couple gentlemen uh, called, and their their entity is called Madison Crossing, um, Dan Ermachinger and John Giuliani. We partnered with them when they brought us a parcel of land and wanted to do some affordable housing on it. Um, they were, uh, um, amenable to bringing that land in as a mm, as a loan to as a how did it come in Nate a contribute no it came in as a loan and they wanted to be paid back for it over time and that was the only way that we could financially make this project work was that they cooperated with us on how the land was paid for how it came into the project um, the land is one of the hardest things to um, to get and in fact availability of land that Greg was talking about was one of the reasons we ended up doing two projects at the same time of this size um, but at Villaggio our other partner is uh, Nate Richman at Blue Line Development and his team they have experience with these larger projects um, they're based here in Missoula we knew them we trusted them they um, have a lot of experience in closing these big deals. I do want to share my screen just for a moment. Um, you, it, it, this is going to give you just a little taste of what it is like to work on a project of this size. This is the org chart for Villaggio. So that hurts to look these... at, Lori. That, that hurts. 
<laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh yeah, it hurt. Yes, it did. Um, it's chaos. Yeah. So um, that's actually Bilbo's family tree in the Lord of the Rings. Uh, <laughs> great reference. <laughs> yeah. So it was a little bit scary, but this is why we needed blue line development because. I could not navigate this on my own. I, we only have two people in our development um, in our development staff at the Housing Authority. Um, me and our project manager, the primary ones involved. So I would never have been able to negotiate this this um, without Blue Line helping us out. So um, I am going to stop that so you can rest your eyes. But these are complicated deals. Um, Trinity is equally as complicated and probably more so because it has the um, navigation center and the permanent supportive housing involved in it and two sites. But those partners are uh, really important. Um, so if you don't have the capacity in house, it's even more critical that you find partners that you trust and that you know have experience and can get you to that closing. As Greg said, um, we'd invested a million dollars by the time we even had this project designed, MHA itself. And that was something that we had agreed up front we were bringing into the project. But at the point where we invested a million dollars, that this project couldn't fail. I didn't have any way to pay back a million dollars to HUD, which is, we had the money from a disposition fund, a disposition of public housing, and they agreed to bring it into the Villaggio project um, because we put 32 project-based vouchers there. So, um, but if this project failed, I had to pay HUD back that million dollars. I couldn't do that. So it was critical that we brought this project to clothing, closing. And um, Nate and his team were just a critical part of that. At, at Trinity, um, I know Heather will speak to this a little bit more, but the it's also a really, really complicated project. As Heather mentioned, having a 50-50 partnership is really tricky because who, con who controls your decisions? You know, what happens if something goes wrong? Um, so we had to, we had to work out um, uh, dispute resolutions and all different kinds of documents. It's very interesting when it comes to the documents. Um, so those, yes, those partners are, for our organization, having really trusted, experienced partners is um, critical. And uh, we have been so lucky in both of these projects to, to have Blue Line and to have Homeward involved with us. If you don't mind, I'm gonna ask one of you guys, I emailed you the other pretty document with all that. If somebody could share their screen and show it, I'd say along the partnership and risk line, I mean, we're talking about the people that are on this panel and us working together. Um, a lot of you've heard me use this analogy before, but I, I say doing a development project with partners is like getting on a river trip. Stuff's gonna hit the fan. Things are gonna get dicey from time to time, but it's gonna be worth the ride. And I'd say so far so good. I mean, another key piece to this is the funding sources, which if you can't see the whole screen, this is our project sign that we were working on the draft of this morning, and I'm not sure we have all the logos. And if you, if you were a partner and it's missing, please let us know because it's not printed yet. But we had city and county and I mean, Department of Commerce uh, worked so closely with us on special requests on how to approach the GC procurement and all the pieces. I mean, really, we can't get um, couldn't have gotten there without the cooperation of uh, between all those entities and having to listen to very complicated descriptions of components and leveraging uh, all the pieces together. So uh, that's another just kind of snapshot of the complications of even the job site sign on a project like this. So another question that, that comes up and um, you've kind of alluded to it all a little bit um, in pieces, but uh, what were uh, design challenges that you came across that are related to the larger scale? There's always a design challenge, you know, whenever you start a project, you get into something you didn't expect. But but when it scales up, what um, you know, what are what are the challenges that you uh, experienced? I know Lori began to talk about it a little bit at Bellagio. You want to um, 
walk us through some of that? Um, sure. Uh, as I mentioned, the site itself was a big challenge in this project. We started out with a design that had multiple buildings and um, it just was too expensive to build. So we worked with the uh, contractor and with the architect to do a complete re redesign basically. Um, I might let Nate take some of this question because um, his team were the ones that took us through all of the necessary variances and easements that we needed in order to build on this site. Uh, the biggest obstacle was the hill, the hillside that we ended up having to um, build around. And uh, we have major retaining walls that are holding up that hill. That's uh, part of the reason the construction cost is high. Um, lots of lots of different things. And Nate, I'm going to let you elaborate on that. Sure. Thanks, Lori. And I think another one of the big challenges when you start to increase the scale of a project is the parking. And just the sheer amount of space that is taken up by um, meeting the minimum parking requirements and then probably going above and beyond that to make sure you're you have adequately parked the site and that your tenants will have a, you know, a place for their vehicles. And so the hill is certainly cut into the usable land on Bellagio, but the, the parking was, was the, was a, at least an equal challenge. And that's what op, you know, opted us to go underground and utilize the space under the build, buildings, but that comes with a significant cost and underground parking is, is not cheap. Um, and it, it adds costs, it adds uh, some technicalities to the design, but I think parking was another big challenge in the, in the design. Uh, Tracy and Greg, you have any thoughts on that? Um, you know, when we, when I look at our experience in Montana and our life in Perno, I think is a no exception. Um, uh, you know, it, it, when you look at scaling up a project and from the design, it's a strict design perspective. I mean, paper and pencil, you, you can make that bigger quick, quickly. Uh, I think our biggest challenge has been just building it. Um, I think a lot of, even the major markets in Montana, building a hundred to 200 unit multifamily properties, the sub base does not exist in most major markets in Montana to, to you know, get one electrical sub, one plumbing sub. So all of our larger projects in Montana have had multiple subs in the same discipline, similar disciplines, just to meet the you know the building timeline that we need to achieve, um, and and just the capacity of you know it's not usually even the local market. These these some of these a lot of these subs are coming from out of out of the market, um, just to support building this number of units and this volume. Um, I mean Missoula may be one of the largest markets. I don't know we haven't developed there, but it sounds like you've got four hundred units going on there, which is quite a scale, um, but I know in our projects, uh, all of our projects, we've had most of our major um, divisions have been covered by at least two subs uh, versus other major markets we are in outside of Montana. We have we have one electrician, we have one plumber, <laughs> that's it. Um, and so I think there's a capacity issue to be careful, make sure your you know, contractors focused on that. Um, I think the second thing is, um, uh, it sort of goes hand in hand a little bit, but you know, labor. I mean, it's there. It's tough out there with some some types of you know sub disciplines um, for them to just staff their crews, and and uh, and especially with the I call it the big the big migration going on right now. I think you're going to see more more and more of that as uh, you know just demand for housing in Montana increases even to even greater you know than just two or three years ago by multiples. And uh, it, you're, you're, you know, sub contractor crews or sub crews are just going around going, going to the highest bidder, period. And that's the way it is. So I think that level of risk, especially in a large project that's trying to keep a timeline is, um, we've seen to be the biggest issue uh, and not specific design issue. I mean, I don't know, Tracy, you remember our, we were, we were like go, no go on this project for almost a year because we were trying to get a covenant in the old PUD that related to our site uh, changed just a little bit. And we had to get sign off from Lowe's Home, home Improvement. I, I, you know, we, we pulled out all the stops. I mean, we almost drove to their headquarters. I, I think it's down in Georgia somewhere. 
I mean, we, we could not get someone to respond and give us a meaningful answer. They, they weren't really giving anything up. We just had to revise this and the city demanded it. So that, that was a challenge. I think the site um, didn't have many other challenges besides a high water table we had to accommodate. But I think all sites have their challenges. Uh, I don't think the scale necessarily adds to that. Um, but I think, you know, sub base in Montana is something to be focused on. And um, uh, the again, the surprises you don't expect, getting a simple approval from a national retailer. <laughs> I don't know. Tracy, I'm sure you have your stories. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that, you know, as you said, I don't think there were any kind of design challenges that weren't pretty easily dispatched. Um, you know, I think that there were, you know, particular like, oh, we got to make sure that there's, you know, a little bit different frontage on this building, for instance, right? I mean, there were there were little things like that. I think that, you know, at the inception of the project, um, you know, the zoning had sort of called for a commercial on each level or a commercial on the ground floor of each building, but that was fairly quickly resolved with the city of Bozeman where they said, oh, you know, we really just want you to activate this corner at Shockey. And we think that that's gonna be a better response for the community. So nothing that wasn't pretty easily addressed from a design standpoint, I would agree with Greg, it's um, getting people, you know, um, Big Sky is such a huge draw for labor, um, you know, so, you know, even if you do kind of finally get people to come work on your project, um, you know, keeping them keeping them on the job is hard um, because there's a lot of money to be made all over the Gallatin Valley, and um, it's so that I think is a real challenge. But I think that um, our team has done, you know, our I think our general contractor has done a really good job of sourcing from, you know, um, you know, sourcing prefab walls just to kind of cut down on some of those pieces. So. Um, that's just one example of, I think, ways that we've tried to address that. And um, I think that the team's been pretty resourceful in uh, trying to address some of those um, challenges of labor and materials. Heather, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I, I'll, I agree with everything that everybody's saying. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, to take it a little bit further, I mean, we, we were able to bring our general contractor on for Trinity and in the early design phases. And to be honest, the group on this panel and a lot of you uh, watching, we know what to build. We know what the most cost-effective system is with the structural system and the building layout. But I feel like we really had to go to another level. Um, we we were, had our general contractor on early, had good numbers, had COVID numbers, even in our budget. Like we'd seen the impacts of the last year. We go to bid in the spring to all the subs and this year in 2021. and. I mean, there was another like lumber spiked up again. Uh, PVC uh, went up, uh, plumbing parts went up. So we just had these additional impacts. You heard about it in the plenary session this morning that we had to deal with. And it, <laughs> when you make it, we have a choice or an impact on a large scale project, it's times 202 on Trinity, right? A $50 choice is times 202 units if it's something with the, so from a scale standpoint, that's just, to illustrate that it, there's just bigger swings. So we've been up and down, up and down on a balanced budget all throughout. And to complicate things, you should try to bid two 200 unit projects within weeks of each other in the same market. And we had to have the hard partner conversation with uh, Blue Line and Housing Authority to be like, get your subs signed because our sub, we're, we don't have subs bidding because we were just a couple of weeks. I mean, they were just ahead of us and it was, I can't imagine how complicated it was for Blue Line and the Housing Authority to be wearing both hats in the middle of that, but there's definitely not enough sub labor to do 400 units all at the same time. So um, we, we, we had to wait, it delayed our closing, but it, both projects kind of navigated that, um, that world and we were all getting real close. So, uh, well, you guys- It sounds, it sounds like close. actually that kind of scale in Missoula is actually may help production because you're going to attract a lot of labor and, and subs to, to to that amount of work and you're going to, you would two projects following each other like that may seem some benefit from the scale yes but the problem again from the plenary session and somebody talked about it today we're actually it's not our problem but it's our problem those subs that we're getting that come in that have large scale capacity they don't have any place to they don't have a cheap hotel to stay at they don't have a campground to stay at I mean, we're looking at all kinds of creative ways to help sub housing uh, because yeah, we did we did attract them to come in, but there's just no place for the housing is an issue. So um, yeah, there's just unintended consequences in this environment today. I think if you looked at the um, progress picks 
of um, Aralees and Perennial, you would see some campers parked along. And um, some of that is, you know, just folks in the community in general who don't have a place to live. Um, yeah. But yeah, housing is certainly a pervasive problem in our communities. Our superintendent is currently living on site. So in a camper, so, yep. <laughs> Wow. So the the final question, which is you can get at any way you want. Um, what do you wish you knew? Um, what do you know now that you wish you knew before you started these projects? Who wants to go first on that one? I'm happy to lead us off there, Jim. I think the Simple and quick answer for me is I wish it, I wish I knew that a two by four was going to more than triple in price in the last year. That would have been a, you know, I would have quit my day job and invested in lumber. But I think the uh, the increase in construction costs and the lack of available labor was was something that when we you know when we started Villaggio that was it's been almost three years since we or I think maybe a little more than three years since we first contemplated this project until we closed it. So it was a much different world three years ago. And particularly from a costing standpoint for the construction side. I was wondering about my crystal ball and my very specific answer is that I wish that I knew that the city can't issue a bond under the same statute that Montana Board of Housing can issue a bond and know that before two weeks before closing, but that's very specific and has some cost ramifications um, that we could get into later in a chat session if you want. But um, I just, yeah, I, I wish I could have predicted the similar things what Nate indicated. It's like, we just, we didn't know all of those things were going to come together. It was kind of worst case scenario, equity pricing dropping, interest rates going up and materials going through the roof and labor going up. It's like one thing going that poorly is hard, let alone all of them, all of the points of the equation. Lori, would you add anything? Um, I, I, uh, those are definitely high on my list. Um, the other thing, uh, especially on Bellagio, is that we used a uh, type of financing that I'd never used before. We started out with a HUD 220, uh, 224, what's the number? Nate. Um, 21D4? Yeah. yeah. We started out with one of those, um, abandoned it because it was taking too long, went to a, went to a Freddie tax exempt loan, um, which was equally as complicated a process, although it didn't take quite as long mm -hmm. and had some surprises for us at the end. So these, um, these different types of loans that you use uh, that you can bring into these projects for your permanent lending especially um, can be really tricky and have some su surprises so um, and they change you know the the process for them changes over time so if you did one three years ago doing it now is going to be different because the rules changed so um, the, the lending part of these deals can be really tricky and, and um, it's, um, I guess I would have liked to understand more about the structure of the loans and the changes that had been made from what they were previously, but I don't know if we could have known that without actually getting into the process, so. We yeah, had, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna <laughs> say we had, on, we had uh, two calls per week um, with, uh, with Bellagio. And on our all call where, where all parties were involved, we had 24 people, most of them lawyers involved. This is where you really appreciate your lawyers and your, attorney, your attorneys who are helping you out with this because um, yeah, you couldn't do this without them either. So, uh, so I would, wanna, I would, if there's any attorneys online, thank you. I was just gonna do an inappropriate shout out to Jen Wheeler at Glacier Bank because that is the easiest part of the Trinity project. So you're right, the lending can be super complicated or more refined. So yeah. agreed. Yeah, I have to say our um, construction loan wasn't that complicated. We did use a local bank for that first interstate and that one went quite smoothly actually. So um, yeah, 
if you if you can get a lo local lender who will take on the risk of these projects, that's that's the way to go. Um, maybe I'll just finish with saying, yeah, what what did I what I wish I knew. Um, you know, when we started doing uh, larger projects uh, here at GMB, um, I think one thing that, and I think I mentioned it prior, but it's just, it's the duration of these projects and that, um, you know, two things happening. I mean, for if you're new construction projects and you're know, getting the site, you know, figured out and, and issues dealt with in terms of utilities, infrastructure, um, uh, PUD, zoning approval, I've just, you know, the duration, several year duration, and it just seems like, seems like we're having larger change. I mean, the, the rate of change, pace of change, just again, financially, programmatically, legislatively is, seems to inc be increasing. I mean, the amount of things that affect the feasibility of a project over a two to three year duration, if you just Let's go talk about 2018, 2019, and 2020. Let's talk about 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, is, it, it seems to be getting more and more and more. And, and I, uh, so what I wish when I first, you know, did our first larger projects with large duration, I, you know, understanding, you know, what the risk was to the organization at different stages of the development, making sure I had mitigants for those, and making sure you have staying power because that's the only way you're gonna get through to find a solution and reformulate a project. And, uh, you know, we learned our lessons hard um, on some of our initial early projects. Now it's par for the course. Um, and it just, it, it's gonna happen. Uh, I, I do, not to, not to d dilute early from perennial, cause I, it's, a, it's a fabulous project and uh, a large project and had certainly had its challenges, but I think you know, the team on that project, and I mean, everybody uh, from HRDC to our commu other community partners and contractor and architect, I mean, we we just came together and, and worked well, and we got to a closing and we didn't have any major issues. I can mention one or two other projects in Montana that are, you know, went, saw so many challenges at every step. And then, you know, and then COVID happened. <laughs> and, uh, but again, um, so it's it's risky. The game, this this, this business is risky. Uh, I know we use uh, public resources and they help, but um, you still somebody still got to pay attention to the bottom line, manage the pieces. Um, and I think the biggest thing I wish I had a better understanding of before doing my first large project uh, was just the duration and making sure I was prepared for it to be longer <laughs> and deal with issues. So, Tracy. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's kind of hit the big things. I mean, I think that it is absolutely inevitable that things will go wrong. And it's also really difficult to know which of the things will go wrong. So I think, you know, as Greg alluded to very early, you know, having, having a lot of flex in that budget because something will go wrong, even if you're not sure what it is. And um, it's usually... Um, not all of the things can go wrong, right? <laughs> so no. you have to have you have to have a budget that reflects some things going wrong, and you have to have just enough luck for all of the things not to go wrong. There's a little bit of there's a little bit in there of like, okay, if everything goes wrong, yes, we're going to lose our shirts on this. So just enough can go wrong. And um, I mean, we joke about it, I think all of the time. One of the fun things about what we do is like, you know, the problem that you're having today, you know, um, the, you know, the millionth time that it looks like the project is going to fail and it somehow rises from the ashes and you're like, wow, we rescued it again. Um, you know, you have to have all these little failures to get a project um, from start to finish. And uh, the fun part is, you know, the problem that you have today in you know three years you'll be like oh yeah you have a whole new problem to deal with and it doesn't even matter that you had that problem back then and you know you're constantly learning and I mean I also am like oh my gosh when will the learning end and it never ends you're you know something new always comes up um, and so it is it's just kind of about accommodating for those surprises um, because they will not stop well said Tracy well said yeah. Hey, Bruce. 
Hey guys, um, so it's two o'clock. Um, this is a little different session because we're rolling right into a question and answer period. So um, it'll be about 30 minutes of questions and answers and discussion. So we hope you can stay, but if you can and have, or if you can't and have to drop off, we certainly do understand. Uh, we want to thank you for joining this session. Remember, you can always participate in community, co community conversations through the Wolva app. Um, to chat with more. Um, but uh, I do see one question uh, in the chat. And then uh, in this session, it's okay to um, undo your video and turn on your microphone and, and ask a question as well. We'll try not to talk over each other, but um, that is an option. So the first question is from Lisa, who who manages these units once completed? Do you have partners with an outside rental management company or manage them in-house? Well, I can start with that one. At Villaggio and Trinity, the, uh, we will manage them. The Missoula Housing Authority will manage them. Um, although we have uh, Blue Line on board to do the initial lease up, um, they, that was a piece that we felt we really needed help with. Um, once the units are leased, then MHA will take over the management of them. Yeah, I'd add to that, Lori. I mean, the difference with Trinity is that there's permanent supportive homes involved, and you guys are doing that at Cornerstone, but you're also going to be leasing up um, Bellagio and Trinity about the same time. And so uh, Blue Line's experience, I think, is critical on that particular type of lease up, and then the what you guys are getting as far as uh, experience with Cornerstone and Mary and the team, that project's amazing and you're just gonna take the next step with us. And typically a project like that, we would be using an outside third party property management company, our partnerships with GMD are that way, different property manager than homeward only projects. But um, yeah, there's a little different uh, nuance. Yeah, we, we use a third party property management company based in Montana, um, I think. You know, whether you're self-managing with the housing authority that has certain has the capacity, um, you know, it, it, to find a management company that has, you know, presence in the market you're in and capacity uh, is, is important. And obviously experience in the industry, affordable housing industry with the programs is very, very important. But um, yeah, we, we, we are, yeah, I think, you know, I'm not sure as much, I mean, difference whether it's self-manage or third party, when you find good, good partners, the management company is a partner in my mind. So, um, you know, you need to have a good partner and, and work closely together and, and for the best outcomes. Great. Um, we have another question. So any advice on how a rural area like Red Lodge, Carbon County without a dedicated housing authority city board, nonprofit, et cetera, could get started on a large community housing development project. What's the first step? Well, I'll toss out and large can be defined in several different ways, right? A uh, large project in Red Lodge may be a different size project than a large project in Bozeman. Uh, but I know um, HRDC has its jurisdiction three county, Lori has hers in Missoula, uh, but we, and Homewards is statewide, uh, and Blue Line and GMD uh, can work across the state and across state boundaries. But as you can tell, hopefully picking up from this conversation is that we all work together really well and collaboratively. And so I think finding a development partner um, and how you approach uh, that, I mean, because it's hard if you don't have a housing authority. And so um, the, the needs grants at the state are very helpful because you need to define your need. I, mean, I can only suspect Red Lodge is hit as, uh, or as challenged as uh, Livingston. We have a project in Livingston with HRDC and then uh, Whitefish with uh, the Whitefish Housing Authority. Um, those communities are just getting hit and compounded by the COVID impacts of people moving to our beautiful state thinking it's safer. Uh, so I think really trying to nail down your need and then working with uh, development partners uh, on you know, what, what would be feasible. Um, that's really general speaking, but we've all worked in rural communities and it's just a little different equation and uh, finding the right partners. Uh, because if you can tell from this uh, conversation, you're getting to a long-term relationship. So it matters <laughs> on the partnership pieces. 
Greg or Nate, I don't know if you'd toss anything in. Um, you know, when I when I hear this question, I've heard it before from uh, local uh, governments or organizations or places that haven't seen a lot of affordable housing development before and the various challenges and, and some of them, a lot of them are you know, smaller communities. Um, and I, my, my first response is, is, you know, go get control of the land, go get the land. Um, I think, you know, Red Lodge is, you know, probably experiencing similar pressure as some of the, you know, more, you know, resort areas of the state, um, which, you know, not just in Montana, but other states, you know, are seeing, we, we thought they were, you know, high value, you know, low housing opportunity locations, a year or two ago, and now it's like three or four times that. Um, and so I just say, you know, if you don't even know what kind of housing it's going to be, what programs you're going to use, just just work, start working on securing the land for whether it's through the city, through the uh, you know a local trust you'll create, which is a great structure. Um, I I recommend that. Uh, two, you know, yeah, you you do need to speak to a developer um, who. I mean, we, I mean, Heather, Lori, Nate, Tracy, we, we've all been in the biz 20 plus years. It, it's, we, 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 we're all friends <laughs> because we've, we've go to the same conferences, we hang out together, it's great. But we, we also have a mind that instantly interprets a location as to whether it's feasible or not under the 9% program, the 4% program, what kind of resources are needed. I think it's really been exciting in Montana as a lot of these resources have evolved over the last, uh, especially last five years. Uh, it, it, it got super exciting a week ago when you almost got a state tax credit, um, but uh, that's unfortunate because um, that would have really opened the geography to a lot of different resources to be able to, you know, bootstrap that state credit onto other federal resources and the geography map would have just opened up. Um, you, you know, I think it's, there's been a lot of affordable housing developed in certain locations in Montana because of, you know, uh, you know, programmatic preferences. Uh, in, you know, uh, you know, expertise location, you know, location of expertise. I mean, Missoula has got, you know, seen a long history of affordable housing development because you have had a lot of organizations based there that, that do it. Um, not so in Red Lodge, but I think, you know, again, there are organizations that work statewide, uh, start working on the land and um, talk to an experienced longtime developer and in you know, about a 15 minute conversation, you, he'll, they'll be able to tell you, uh, you know, how long the path will be <laughs> and what the real options are. And Greg, so just, I, would, I would add to that as, ahead, as well that, you know, I've, we've done numerous small projects and projects in rural communities across Montana and Wyoming over the years. And one of the things that really will attract a developer is having pretty broad community support. And, you know, no one wants to go into a, a small community and be run out of there with pitch, pitchforks and torches because no one wants the housing. So if you can get the, the city or, or the county behind the housing and, and show that you have that, that sort of community support, that goes a long way to, to sort of pave the way for the housing and, and, and make it more attractive to a developer to come in and, and help provide that. I was just gonna add a little bit to what Greg touched on and I've been, I promised I would behave on this call because last week, we didn't get a state housing credit passed. And so now turning that into a positive is that we need to all work really hard over the next two years uh, to get it back through session and to the table uh, because it will be a game changer. It will open up all kinds of markets and help the Red Lodge community and the other the rural communities uh, because a 4% a standalone project as much as we were up here saying how challenged we were, uh, it's, it, we can't do that in those small communities, but 9% you know, is a very limited resource. But if the state can get behind a state credit and then we can bring the economic impact in the equity spent in Montana and the homes built. So um, help the housing coalition, all the people uh, continuing to work on these issues. Um, the only piece I think I would add on even to Nate's statement in talking about building your local support and that broad-based coalition, as I would say, in every community where I've worked, um, until your local business community views this as an emergency, um, your community will not develop the type of broad-based support that's necessary to really push it forward. So 
um, you know, working with your local chamber of commerce, lo working with business owners, I think is where you start to coalesce around housing as a real community need that is impacting economic viability. And I think that is a lot of times where you get the legs for that community support. I think I would add uh, just a piece of information in that in order to make a strictly 4% project work, you need the scale that we're talking about here. 200 units is about the break even point where you can even make a 4% a tax credit project work in Montana. So Heather touched on it at the very beginning. We had a, we had a piece of land that could hold 70 units and a piece of land that could hold 130 units. Neither of them were appropriate. Neither of them could have worked with just 9% credits. Um, neither of them could, or were big enough to, to use just 4% credits. So that's, you know, that bringing them together to get to the 200 unit breaking point was what made that project work. So when you're talking about going into more rural communities, smaller communities like Red Lodge, you have to keep that in mind that you need a certain you need a certain number of units to make some of these funding sources work. And that's something that you want to explore uh, pretty thoroughly before you start, you know, like Greg said, I agree, get the land and then explore the funding sources that are appropriate for the size of housing that you can put on your piece of land. And Laura, and that's a, a great point and something to kind of add into that is a couple of the components that that make these large 4% deals work or scale, um, as, as you've heard mentioned a couple of times from the folks here is uh, being located in a qualified census tract to get that basis boost and the availability of some soft funding, both state and local. And so that, that really you can't make these stand alone if you're not in a QCT, you don't have the scale to support the of some sort of gap filler from either state. All right. Hey, you were cutting out just slightly. I didn't know if that was me or you. So um, I don't have any more questions in the chat. Is there anyone that wants to unmute and show your video and ask a question. Well, you covered it all. You guys have covered Great everything. Great panel, guys. <laughs> so one thing, um, this is probably a little more in the weeds, but it's just, uh, since I'm into bonds and I love tax exempt bonds, um, so uh, have all have all of these been done as conduit bond deals, and then um, who do you sell the bonds to? Um, I, could, I could just speak from Villaggio and Trinity. Um, both of those were a, a Freddie Tell takeout on the the bond structure. Um, you know, when you're talking about as we've talked earlier, the the time frame and over three years of working on those, a lot changes. If I was going to do Villaggio today, I would probably look at a private placement, just given what's yeah. happened with with rates and with some of the pro programmatic challenges of the Freddie Tell. But you know, you just sort of pick the pick what you think is the right horse and, at the time and and ride it on through. But a lot changes from from start to finish. But those were both Tell takeouts. And actually, we converted late later in the game to uh, Glacier Bank and private because sorry, yes, what I, you guys were yeah. what you were seeing on Bellagio because again, deal yeah. merge those well, two yeah, projects well, at the same I've time. Too many of those <laughs> going on at once, but and Glacier, so um, Glacier Bank, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, I, th I mean, you know, I think the bond market in terms of, I mean, I know the word tax and bond sometimes scares people and doesn't know what that is. I mean, but you know, the bottom line is it's it, you know. It's obviously a loan that has tax exempt interest to the purchaser of that note. Um, and it's just a loan like anything else, but the, the tax exempt bond, it's a structure. Um, I mean, a lot earlier on, I mean, 10 years ago, most, most bond deals were conduit placements, uh, public sales, you know, so you're selling it to bondholders, you're selling it to a group uh, through, uh, you know, a, a um, 
through an underwriter and an issuer, I mean, through an underwriter that was basically underwriting those bonds and selling them. Uh, but the market's evolved. You have a lot of banks now that do what are called direct purchase. Um, and I think having one lender involved, um, you can get more quickly understand what the terms are. I think Lori touched on, you know, working with different lenders like HUD or Freddie. Uh, those are you know, great programs. Uh, they are programs um, and they can offer sometimes uh, really the best interest rates on the market. But I think, you know, when you're sizing up debt, Term, I mean, ter terms are also meaningful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, with, with a bond transaction, you know, when you close your construction loan, you are also closing a forward rate lock perm loan. And, you know, what I've learned over time is a, a lot happens between the time you close your construction loan and you've built the project and you've leased it up and you're ready to convert. A lot of things like median income changes. A lot of things like, a lot of things. And so, I don't know, I, I have leaned toward working with more regional banks that actually hold the loans on their books, on their shelves, and that has offered certain flexibility that it's been useful. Um, so, just a thought, but again, Freddie and Van, uh, FHA, those are great programs uh, with specific features that can, it can't be matched by some small you know, uh, banks or direct banks. Um, and so I think you really need to get into the weeds, create a grid, get three, get four proposals, understand all the differences and uh, make your decision. And yeah, don't forget duration. Great answer. Um, I think, you know, the one question when we, they talk about how can you do a project like that on Red Lodge, you know, just Keep in mind, 4% might not be the answer, but 9% might be in a Red Lodge area. So, and I know at least for Montana housing, I don't believe we've done a tax credit deal in Red Lodge since I don't, long, long, long time ago. So, I think one, wrong. Oh, go ahead. I mean, go ahead, Tracy. I, the only thing I'd add to that is that, you know, in a lot of the small rural communities where we are working, um, adaptive reuse is often overlooked. Um, there are oftentimes, you know, existing buildings. Um, so, you know, particularly given the cost of materials in some of these communities and the difficulty in getting people to communities, um, being able to maybe reduce scope and an adapt adaptive reuse. Well, I, I, I say reduce scope loosely, uh, <laughs> but I do think that um, it, that can be overlooked sometimes in communities as well. So. It's true. Um, I mean, we've done several projects. The one Tracy's giggling at probably is it's not a reduced scope at Lara Livingston where we adapted the Livingston Memorial Hospital into 37 homes. Um, and we were able to pair the 9% tax credit with federal historic credits. Um, that's a whole nother conversation to have, but uh, you know, trying to leverage those credits further. And I do think it's been a while and Terry's right. There was a project in Red Lodge uh, about 17 years ago. It'd be a very competitive 9% ask if it has back to what we talked about, the community support. When we applied for a project in Whitefish with the housing authority, the, the economic groups were behind it. The city was behind it. Everybody was behind it because it was a con everybody knew what the problem was and they could speak to it holistically, uh, the jurisdiction, uh, the uh, chamber of commerce. And so, I think that the steps to take are to, to prime the pump for an application. There's the market, the need, find a building, find a piece of land, but really trying to wrap your head around need and getting support for the project is key. And I know that HRDC does a ton of work in a lot of the rural communities and I've participated in some of the working sessions to get those planning pieces together and have those key conversations. Uh, so it's really important. Awesome. Any final questions? This is your last chance, guys. We're we got a few minutes, so if you want. Well, and there's nothing wrong with getting done early either. So, so um, if there's no other questions, I guess I want to thank um, all of the panelists and everyone that presented today. And I I always learn something new as I talk to you folks. Um, about all this stuff. So that's the end of today. Um, so you guys can go off and have a great evening. Tomorrow, 
at eight is the coffee talk. So that's an optional thing and folks can join that. We encourage you to do so. And then at nine is our plenary session. Um, we've got some awards, we've got a speaker. Um, it'll be a really good session at nine. So please uh, make it for that. So with that, I think I will bid you say good night and see you guys tomorrow. Bye guys. Thank you everyone, Thank you, everyone for joining guys. us. Thanks. 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 Bye.